Good morning. I'm delighted to be with you today for this important meeting. The title of today's symposium, Innovations in a Changing World, truly captures the essential dynamic that we face as medical scientists, researchers, and regulators in our work to get safe, effective, and high quality medical products to more patients. Not coincidentally, perhaps, it also typifies two key principles that we advance and balance in our work at the FDA, supporting and speeding innovations that make medicine safer or more effective, while helping to ensure that the public has the accurate science-based information it needs uh, to use those medicines to improve their health. This work is very meticulous and must be responsive to the dynamic nature of medical science. What that means is we're constantly acquiring, reviewing, and evaluating new data and expanding the evidence upon which we base our decisions to make sure those decisions are as comprehensive as possible and Americans can be confident in the quality of the products that FDA approves. It also means developing and embracing new technologies and regulatory tools to support innovation and the decisions that lead to the development and manufacturing of new products. Now, this approach involves the entire drug life cycle from the earliest stages of product development to manufacture, distribution, and our surveillance of post-market safety. One of the most important tools in our arsenal for ensuring the safety, effectiveness, and quality of the products we regulate is our review, surveillance, and compliance efforts, including the inspections of uh, manufacturing sites. As drug manufacturing has globalized over the years, we've modernized our policies to ensure that every manufacturer of a drug, whether it's made in the US or overseas, meets the FDA's strict standards for producing medicines for US patients and undergoes the same rigorous application process with the information carefully reviewed by our highly trained scientific staff. The FDA's global inspection efforts focus on higher risk facilities to prevent, uncover, and combat data integrity issues and manufacturing problems. We also monitor reports from industry, patients, and healthcare providers to identify and resolve potential quality problems. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to adjust some of our processes and guidance to maintain the appropriate level of review to fulfill our mission to protect public health. Um, therefore, we can continue to ensure the safety of FDA regulated products, as well as protect the safety of our inspectors and the staff of firms subject to FDA inspection. We actually employed a number of novel tools in support of this risk-based approach, including doing remote assessments virtually and interactive evaluations and uh, working with import alerts. For example, we've used our authority under Section 704A4 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to request records in advance of or in lieu of an inspection for drug and biological products. As a result, the FDA so far has been able to act on applications in a timely manner over 90% of the time across our user fee programs. But this has been a very heavy lift and required a lot of innovation. I am pleased to say that as of July, we began resuming normal operations for domestic inspections, what we call the base case scenario of our resiliency roadmap for FDA inspectional oversight. Even as we've begun this process, we also recognize that the actions we've taken and the tools we've used to adapt can play an important role going forward in prioritizing risk-based deployment of our inspection resources. And so we look forward on building uh, on these tools uh, where appropriate. Now, inspections are not the agency's only area of innovation. Another program involves the development of quality management maturity or QMM ratings. What these do is help establish and maintain consistent, reliable and robust business processes to achieve quality policies and objectives. To fully realize the FDA's modern pharmaceutical quality vision requires a focus on continual process and system improvement and a transparent 
method of evaluating, characterizing, and communicating the state of QMM for manufacturing sites. Now, people may be familiar with this from the IT world and other worlds where quality maturity has been uh, uh, measured uh, for many years. The system we've developed has helped us understand which drug manufacturing sites go above and beyond the minimum practices required by CGMP regulations. They also inform purchasers about the state of and commitment to quality management at the facility that makes the drugs they buy. Currently, we have two QMM pilot programs, one for domestic sites for finished dosage form manufacturers and another for uh, foreign sites for active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers. The FDA has also formed a multidisciplinary multi-center working group to facilitate the development of the QMM rating program for drug manufacturers. The goal is to develop a framework to objectively assess and rate the QMM of manufacturing sites using facilitated assessments along with other surveillance intelligence related to the site. Now, yet another important way the FDA is working to provide a um, higher quality and more secure drug supply is through the development of an investment and application in advanced manufacturing technology. The FDA has long recognized the importance and potential advanced manufacturing, which can be more cost effective than traditional manufacturing technology and may enable the US to play a larger role in pharmaceutical manufacturing. <clears throat> And of course, I have been an advocate of this for quite a long time. Advanced manufacturing can improve product quality and process quality, ad advance uh, the shortage of, dealing with shortages of medicines and speed time to market. <clears throat> it's a key component of a broader US strategy to strengthen domestic drug manufacturing and increase the domestic supply of high quality medical products for consumers thereby improving the global competitiveness of U.S. marketing and the robustness of our manufacturing base. When manufacturers are able to produce medications in newer, more expedient, and more flexible ways, patients suffering from a variety of diseases, including cystic fibrosis, HIV, breast cancer, leukemia, and asthma, can experience added benefits. With congressional support, the FDA has invested in a number of advanced manufacturing related projects. And we continue to work with manufacturers looking to implement these new technologies to benefit even more patients and foster growth. Our Center for Drug Evaluation and Research has established a variety of initiatives in this area, including the development of a research program to better understand the science of advanced manufacturing and support our ability to approve high quality, safe and effective drugs made by manufacturing technologies that ensure a seamless supply of these medicines. To date, this program has supported nearly 60 research projects, including many collaborations with experts in the field. The knowledge gained has helped us provide guidance for applicants who are seeking to use such new technologies. These include continuous manufacturing, a technology that produces medicines in an integrated uh, flowing process as opposed to the traditional uh, unit operations process that em employs stops and starts between different steps. To reduce barriers for entry for advanced manufacturing, the Center for Drugs created the Emergency Technology Program or ETP this is designed to provide a gateway for the early pre-submission discussion of innovative technologies and approaches, even before a candidate drug is identified. The technology may be used at a facility that manufactures multiple products, meaning could potentially have an impact for a lot of drugs. In addition, our Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research receiver established the Advanced Technologies Team uh, to offer pre-submission support for applicants looking to adopt advanced manufacturing technologies for the development of human drugs. And our colleagues in the Office of Regulatory Affairs are focused on strengthening their advanced manufacturing training 
for field investigators through strategic personnel additions. Recent data suggests these efforts are working. In 2015, the FDA approved the first regulatory submission for a human drug produced by continuous manufacturing and the first produced by 3D printing. We have now approved finished dosage forms and active pharmaceutical ingredient and biological molecules produced using advanced manufacturing technologies. More than 80% of the drugs made using these advanced technologies are produced in the US. We're confident this trend will continue. To date, the FDA has accepted more than 100 proposals spanning a wide range of innovative technology and have sponsored more than 100 meetings with those interested in developing these. In fact, the workload of the uh, ETP has increased to the point we're creating ETP 2.0 to meet workload challenges and enhance communication with companies that would like to adopt advanced manufacturing technologies in the future. One last point on advanced manufacturing. Since most pharmaceutical firms have a global operation footprint, the FDA is also collaborating with our international regulatory counterparts in this area. We're encouraging industry investment in advanced manufacturing methods through our leadership in the International Council on Harmonization, or ICH, to harmonize global regulatory standards for continuous manufacturing. And we're spearheading the new draft ICH Q13 guideline on continuous manufacturing of drug substances and drug products, which is now available for public comment. That's a good milestone. Clearly, it's an exciting time with extraordinary opportunities. There's one final point I wanna make about our efforts to strengthen manufacturing and improve pharmaceutical quality. And that is that all these exciting regulatory tools and promising technologies are buttressed by the core element of the FDA's work. Our focus on applying the best available science and the most rigorous data to inform our decisions. Let me close by offering an example of the impact strong science has on effective regulatory action. It involves nitrosamines, an impurity in human drugs that may increase the risk of cancer if people are exposed to them above acceptable levels over long periods of time. Their presence had led us to ask for recalls of certain drugs, schedule for cause inspections of manufacturing sites, issue warning letters based on violative inspections, and place uh, manufacturers uh, wanting to import on import alert based on violative findings. Before we took these actions, though, we needed to be able to detect the nitrosamines in a variety of substrates. Cedar scientists developed the means to do just that through testing to detect for these impurities, which are extremely low levels. We then shared the methods with industry and international regulators and developed recommendations for industry to conduct risk assessments for their drugs and make necessary manufacturing and supply chain changes to prevent or reduce the presence of nitrosamines, including in a published guidance for industry. We also continue to work closely with our regulatory scientist partners around the world on intake limits for nitrosamines and to monitor safety signals for products that may include higher than accepted limits. In short, science was our guiding light, helping us in our development of regulatory tools and actions to ensure that the medications that people take are safer and of higher quality. We'll continue to remain vigilant in addressing potential issues in the global drug supply chain and using all the technologies and regulatory tools at our disposal to do so. In this way, we can continue to ensure that Americans have confidence in the safety and quality of their medicines and that we fulfill our mission to protect and promote public health. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Woodcock. It's always such a pleasure to listen to your insights and perspectives. 
Next, I am honored to introduce Dr. Mike Kopscher, who will deliver OPQ's Office of Pharmaceutical Qualities keynote. Dr. Kopscher is the director of the FDA's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, OPQ, and this office has over 1,300 staff responsible for assuring the availability of quality medicines for the American public through assessment, inspection, surveillance, research, and policy. OPQ contributes to the assessment of nearly every type of human drug marketing applications, including new drug applications, abbreviated new drug applications, and biologics license applications, which include 351K applications, that is, biosimilars. OPQ also performs the quality assessment of investigational new drug applications and establishes quality standards for over-the-counter drug products and facilities. Let us give Dr. Kupcher an enthusiastic welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Pharmaceutical Quality Symposium. I am Mike Kupcher. I am the director for the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. My presentation today obviously is going to be focusing on pharmaceutical quality, but more specifically on innovations in a changing world. As I typically like to do when I present on pharmaceutical quality is just to make sure that everyone is grounded in terms of how I uh, define pharmaceutical quality. And I look at it that a quality product of any kind consistently meets the expectations of the user. And drugs should be treated no differently. So whether we're looking at a computer, whether we're looking at a car, a smartphone, um, or a drug, um, drugs are treated no differently. For us, or at least for me, the main difference is that the um, uh, user or the ultimate user is the patient and or the consumer of the product. So as we all know, patients expect safe and effective medicine with every dose that they take. So we can define pharmaceutical quality as assuring that every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination, as well as defects. So it is what gives patients then confidence in their next dose of medicine. So this kind of gives us a good grounding. It's a nice way for me to remember pharmaceutical quality, and hopefully you'll remember it as well and adopt this uh, definition, especially as we go through this presentation or the presentations during the symposium. So when we think about a product, whether it's medicine or a phone or a car, we often focus on the development and design of the finished product. The component or components often overlooked are manufacturing and supply chain. Yet, as Elon Musk will tell you, manufacturing and supply chain often require orders of magnitude more work. For any product, manufacturing and supply chain are critical elements, ensuring product quality as well as its availability. Certainly during the COVID-19 public health emergency, this became more evident than ever before. So today we'll start the symposium with a session reflecting on some of the lessons we've learned during the COVID-19 public health emergency. As part of the session, I will provide part of an extended live discussion with a panel of FDA leaders. So to prepare you for this later discussion, I'll quickly share some of the lessons I've learned over the course of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Our communication, especially through rapid guidance, was critical. We've now published over 30 guidance documents since the pandemic began. FDA guidance has covered varied and critical topics related to pharmaceutical quality, including hand sanitizers, supply chain, and monoclonal antibodies. Collaboration was also essential, especially with our ORA colleagues, who we work with to keep U.S. pharmaceuticals safe and available. Collaborations help to guide decisions, such as determining what was mission critical and which inspections we could conduct given travel restrictions. We also work together to develop the strategy needed to conduct remote regulatory assessments.
We also needed innovation, particularly as related to facility oversight. We relied heavily on alternative tools to inspections, such as requesting information in lieu of inspections and conducting remote interactive evaluations. We also had vital engagement through mutual recognition agreements and with trusted international regulatory partners. Using these tools, we met our user fee goals over 90% of the time across human drug user fee programs. While not all applications have recommended pre-approval inspections, historically around 20%, we've used alternative tools to reduce the need for pre-approval inspections a further 50%. Today's afternoon session will continue to focus on regulatory innovation by highlighting some of the creative work being done to address challenges in pharmaceutical quality. The first innovation I'll highlight is the Knowledge Aided Assessment and Structured Application Program, or as we like to call CASA, which won the Federal Health IT Innovation Award this year which was a significant achievement for, for all of us in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. CASA is a structured knowledge management program enabling management of quality risks across FDA-approved drug products and facilities. Next, I'll note our quality surveillance dashboard, a framework for consistent surveillance of CEDAR-regulated facilities. The CARES Act enhances the ability to identify prevent and mitigate possible drug shortages by improving FDA's visibility into drug supply chains. CEDAR's Office of Compliance will discuss innovations that have fueled recent facility compliance and enforcement actions. It's vital that we collaborate with our counterparts globally to align our processes and expectations. We'll discuss how FDA is engaging in international regulatory harmonization. You'll hear about the program Dr. Woodcock mentioned on quality management maturity, which works to better inform purchasers of quality management maturity of their drug manufacturers. And finally, one innovation that I do want to personally spotlight is Align Teams in our Integrated Quality Assessment, or what we call our IQA Teams or IQA program. Align teams are small pools of individuals across assessment disciplines from which IQA teams are assigned. Align teams are now in place for all application types and prescription drug user fee programs. So I wanted to be very clear about that. Align teams improve role clarity, collaboration, and the overall assessment process by fostering stronger connections between team members, which is extremely important in any team setting. BLA and ANDA applications adopt, adopted Align Teams last summer, and as of last month, they are adopted for all NDA and 30-day safety IND packages. In fact, Align Teams enabled the approval of a complex generic product using the treatment of ovarian cancer and multiple myeloma. You'll hear more about these innovations, including Align Teams, in this afternoon's session. Then tomorrow, we'll start off the day focusing on a foundation of science, which, as you know, is the basis of everything we do at the agency. Science informs our assessment, our guidance, and our regulatory actions. In my Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, we have a robust laboratory research program with labs both in Silver Spring, Maryland, and St. Louis, Missouri. Some research staff has been working on site throughout the pandemic to conduct mission critical testing and research. Our lab program directly feeds our policy and assessment programs and enables, for example, the approval of complex medicines. Research also helps us anticipate and understand complex advanced manufacturing technologies being adopted to meet the needs of patients now as well as in the future. Science isn't only in the lab. Each fiscal year, our team in the Office of Quality Surveillance puts out a report on the state of pharmaceutical quality. 
Some of the data in this report is striking to me. For example, the data on the history of recalls tells the story of the major quality issues since I've joined the FDA. A 2017 spike in antibacterial products was driven by two products reporting subpotency or potential contamination. Nitrosamines found initially in Valsartan in 2018 led to recalls of cardiovascular agents and later in products including the gastrointestinal agent ranitidine. Methanol detected in alcohol-based hand sanitizers led to recalls and eventually the first ever, the first ever Cedar Countrywide Import Alert. Of course, recalls wouldn't happen at all in the ideal world. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. Our final session then focuses on getting us closer to an ideal world by adopting advanced manufacturing. As Dr. Woodcock explained, advanced manufacturing is the use of an innovative manufacturing technology or approach to improve drug quality and or the reliability of the manufacturing supply chain. Advanced manufacturing is a key component of the overall U.S. strategy to strengthen domestic drug manufacturing and increase the domestic supply of quality products. It can also enable developing drugs rapidly and preventing drug shortages. As the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly taught us, agility and flexibility are needed to maintain pharmaceutical quality in a public health emergency. FDA's vision has long been a maximally efficient, agile, flexible pharmaceutical manufacturing sector that reliably produces high quality drugs without extensive regulatory oversight. So what I'd like to talk uh, about next is that Dr. Woodcock did address a number of ways we've worked to advance advanced manufacturing. So I want to highlight that we are actively addressing knowledge and experience gaps to form an advanced manufacturing regulatory framework to provide clarity and reduce uncertainty for manufacturers. For example, we funded a series of workshops at the National Academies that resulted in a published consensus report on pharmaceutical manufacturing innovations in the pipeline. We've been quietly working hard to develop a regulatory framework for advanced manufacturing in an effort we call the Framework for Advanced Manufacturing Evaluation, or the acronym we apply to that is FRAME. And FRAME aims to provide clarity and reduce uncertainty for products manufactured with advanced technologies. We've, access, we, we've assessed um, existing guidances, as well as regulations and statutes for gaps in pain points and conducted in-depth impact analysis to make preliminary recommendations for this regulatory framework. Now we are just beginning our public outreach and engagement for public input to further inform our thinking and begin the implementation of components of this regulatory framework. To maintain the momentum in the Human Drug and Biologics Program, CEDAR and our counterparts in CBER recently established an internal Center for Advancement of Manufacturing Pharmaceuticals and Biopharmaceuticals. We are, our plan is to use this center then to enhance coordination and collaboration on the science and policy surrounding advanced manufacturing. So what we want to be uh, so while we want to be as innovative as possible with these new technologies, we also need to be preparing to regulate them as well. So in closing, last year and much of this year proved that innovation is key in responding to public health emergencies and meeting the needs of both patients and consumers. So we were all forced to solve the problems of a changing world. Now let's continue to innovate today to improve the quality of medicines tomorrow. So I'd like to take this time to thank you for the privilege of your time and to um, ask you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the symposium over the next two days. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Renu Lal and I work with Brenda Stoddard in the SBIA program. 
I'll be one of your moderators today. Today, uh, we will be listening to first four presentations before our first panel discussion. I will be introducing our speakers. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucinda or Cindy BUC, Deputy Director for Operations in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, or OPQ. Dr. BUC also has had roles as Director for the Office of uh, Quality Surveillance and Director for the Office of Testing and Research. Next, we will hear from Dr. Lori Graham, who is currently Director of the Division of Internal Policies and Programs in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. Her division is responsible for the development and evaluation of CEDAR's internal policies and programs related to pharmaceutical quality, including application assessment and inspection. And next, we will hear from Dr. Stelios Sinantidis. He's director of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment within OPQ. His office evaluates facilities, process design, and control strategies to assess capabilities of manufacturers to produce quality pharmaceutical and biotechnology products at commercial scale, and provides leadership and technical expertise to agency components of internal and external to OPQ regarding manufacturing quality issues. And finally, we will hear from Nancy Rowley, Deputy Director of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations, a program within the Office of Regulatory Affairs, or ORA, at FDA. As Deputy Director, she assists with coordination and management of ORA's field activities and works in close conjunction with CEDAR and the Center for Veterinary Medicine. Let's turn our attention over to our speakers. Hello. I'll be discussing the regulation of pharmaceutical quality in the U.S. and a little bit about the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. For today's learning objectives, first, define pharmaceutical quality and its importance to patients, then describe how FDA regulates pharmaceutical quality and the roles and responsibilities of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. As we heard, Pharmaceutical quality is consistently meeting standards that ensure every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. However, pharmaceutical quality is also linked to drug availability. We've learned that over the last few years in the drug shortage report that we published a couple years ago. Over 60% of drug shortages could be traced to some issue with pharmaceutical quality. In addition, the public health emergency, COVID-19, has really shown some of the vulnerabilities in our supply chain and how those supply chain issues can really affect drug availability. And it's not just availability of a finished dose or an API. We're also seeing supply chain issues with components, such as vials and filters and caps, and some um, facilities are also um, swamped with manufacturing vaccines, which can cause backups in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical drugs as well. There's a lot of history of events that have led to where we are currently with the FDA. Obviously, safety studies, everyone knows about the, uh, the deaths in 1938, putting in place the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And then amendments to that in 1962, where drugs had to be safe and effective. In 2015, OPQ was formed to really put an emphasis on pharmaceutical quality. This was after a heparin crisis and after we started to see the fact that shortages are really due to quality issues. And certainly in the last year plus, we've seen um, a new um, focus on supply chain issues. We've seen a focus on alternative tools for site evaluations. We've seen the need for more and more rapid approvals and authorizations for site changes, authorizations for changes in suppliers to, so we can keep the supply going. And also coming with that is also an increased need for international collaboration so that we can all learn from each other across the globe as we approve new drugs and as we approve changes to existing drugs to keep them on the market. So as I've already alluded to, in the era of the 
COVID-19, long existing quality issues are now magnified. That includes supply chain, um, shortages, and decision making based on changing science and risk. So we see that we have to make a lot of decisions, minimal data, either to approve not new drugs or to approve new sites for existing drugs, to approve changes to suppliers of caps and bottles and filters or API for existing drugs. And uh, this is definitely a, a, a place we need a strong office to do quality. So what are the FDA's tools for regulating quality? There's a lot of different ways we can do it, and they all work together to give us as big a picture as we can before we try to make a decision. We want to improve patient access without sacrificing quality, actually. One big way that people are aware of is assessment. Uh, that's um, you know where we get your application or your supplement, and we can take a look and see if we think we've done the right thing. And then often that can lead to inspection, of where we go on site, uh, to make sure that your data is good, make sure that you're ready to manufacture, and make sure you're following current GMPs. Um, during that time and after approval, we do a lot of engagement um, with you, outreach, et cetera, to make sure that um, we are, everything's moving along and that the application can be approved as soon as possible. Um, Post-approval, we have a quality surveillance to make sure that the the drug on the market matches what we think it should be in terms of quality, what we expect for market. Enforcement, hopefully we never get there, but if we find issues, um, we can turn it over to Office of Compliance for enforcement issues. Part of surveillance includes testing, and really to stay ahead of where we need to be tomorrow, we also do a lot of research and policy development to communicate our newest thinking and also to make sure we have the newest science when it comes to doing assessment, comes to doing surveillance, or comes to doing policy. Office of Pharmaceutical Quality doesn't do this alone. Um, we work with the Office of Compliance, and we all work with the Office of Regulatory Affairs, ORA, Pharma Program, to give one quality voice, to have one message about what quality should be for pharmaceuticals. For Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, which I'll talk about in more depth today, we have a, a structure, includes two different sides. Michael Kopcha is our office director, and we have two deputies, myself, office director of operations, and Sal Larry Lee, who's the office deputy director of science. So on the science side, we have the four assessment offices who are dealing with the applications that are coming in, the supplements, et cetera, to, uh, to make sure that the, the drug submissions move through OPQ. On the operations side, we have all of the pieces that are needed to enable that uh, approval, and we also take a look at um, over-the-counter drugs when it comes to surveillance and policy, as well as uh, those other, other non-application drugs, such as homeopathics, et cetera. So I'm the Deputy Office Director of Operations. We have administrative operations, keeping us all going, hiring, travel, um, et cetera, budget. We have the Office of Program and Regulatory Operations, OPRO, Don Henry, and he does the project management for the assessment side. And Ashley Baum runs our policy shop. Surveillance, quality surveillance is Jennifer McGuire, and Office of Testing and Research is David Curie. So that's the operations side. So the science side is all assessment. We do um, BLAs, we do NDAs, we do ANDAs, and we do all of the supplements that, uh, and the CBEs that go with that. So as you can see from our structure, that we look at quality across the entire drug product life cycle, from an IND um, all the way to post-marketing. So every, we do every type of drug that's on the market, all of the application drugs, uh, we do the non-application drugs when it comes to surveillance and policy, et cetera. And so our goal, of course, is to assure quality medicines are consistently available. We work quite closely with drug shortage to proactively work to prevent drug shortages where possible, whether it's to approve a new application, whether it's to help with changes to an existing application, and we ensure um, parity between brand and generic drugs. So what is it we're doing? Well, by the numbers, this kind of gives you a feel of the workload that comes through the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. 
We have around 1,300 staff, and we get quite a few submissions a year between the biologics, the new drugs, the INDs, the generics, and the supplements. Surveillance itself is around 6,000 facilities, including the non-application products that I've mentioned, like homeopathic and others that are monograph products. We also have our research um, and testing laboratories. We do a lot of publications and technical reports as well to try to communicate maybe the newest technologies to, for pharmaceutical quality. And then numerous policy documents for both internal and external use so that we can communicate um, the newest policies both internal to our, to our own staff as well as to our stakeholders. When it comes to the quality assessment side on the science side, we do that with an integrated quality assessment team, and that team brings together reviewers that have expertise in different areas. We have the drug substance experts, drug product experts, manufacturing experts, biopharma experts that come together, take a look at the different parts of the application, and really determine whether it's approvable, and if not, what is missing. For that, um, they may pull in some other technical advisors, sometimes folks from the laboratories, sometimes from policy, if it's some kind of a, an innovative, groundbreaking um, product. And surveillance may be brought in as well if there's issues with, um, with a facility or issues with, a, with some kind of um, post-market quality of similar products, and others as needed to ensure a complete review of the submission. So when it comes to actual surveillance, as I mentioned, there's about 6,000 sites, and those are non-medical gas manufacturers that we take a look at and constantly doing quality surveillance on. And of those, slightly uh, half of them are foreign and the rest are domestic. We work closely with the ORA to do surveillance of these sites. And we, as the Office of Quali Pharmaceutical Quality, determine when we're going to do, which sites we're going to do surveillance on any given year. Within those sites, you can see there's over 30,000 unique products and 20,000 active pharmaceutical ingredients um, as well that we're trying to do surveillance on at any one time. So sources for quality surveillance in the post-marketing world. Um, here's a list of the kinds of things we look at, not only facility inspection data, but obviously quality defect reports in terms of whether we get a MedWatch report from a consumer or whether the sites have a lot of recalls or if it's consumer complaints come in, field alert reports, et cetera, and informants as well. They all go into our assessment of when we should do some additional action or surveillance on either facility, a firm, or product. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we do test product on the market as well. And uh, we take a look at application data, both original and supplements, annual report information to see if they can give us any information about surveillance as well. We are currently also working on quality metrics and quality management maturity as two other factors that can go into our quality surveillance programs. Science and research, we have many different areas of expertise in our laboratories. Um, five of which are shown here. So in, do, in addition to the testing I mentioned as part of surveillance, we're also always trying to do innovative tests, innovative research to try to move pharmaceutical um, regulations forward, whether that's through advanced manufacturing, through our manufacturing science and innovation laboratories, or whether that's through the immunology, infectious disease, and tumor biology um, laboratories. So what's the future of pharmaceutical quality? The, um, there's a lot going on, some of which I've alluded to and it's been alluded to earlier in previous talks. Um, number one, advanced manufacturing research and regulatory framework is something that OPQ is working on so that we are prepared to receive any kind of advanced manufacturing um, that uh, someone may want to submit to us. It's important that we understand the supply chain, and that's one of the things that has come out of this public health emergency, is making sure that we have both the regulations, the authority, and the technology to look and understand the supply chain. 
We're putting in place a quality management maturity program as outlined in our drug shortage report from 2019 so that there can be more transparencies between the buyers and the manufacturers of drugs. We've done a lot of international um, convergence over the last year and a half working with our regulators on not only drugs critical to COVID-19, but also on the nitrosamine impurity contamination issues, and that really ramped up and really hopefully will also be of, of, uh, of help to stakeholders trying to sell drugs globally and work with so many different regulatory agencies. And so that leads them to, of course, fostering global partnerships to ensure that uh, we can be as consistent as possible across the globe to really facilitate um, pharmaceutical quality. So, questions from the challenge. What percent of non-medical gas pharmaceutical facilities are located in the U.S.? 10%? 20%? 26%? Eighty percent. As I mentioned, it's just under half are located in the U.S. Which of the following statements is true? OPQ is responsible for clinical review of drugs. OPQ regulates pharmaceutical quality only for generic drugs. OPQ regulates pharmaceutical quality only for small molecules, new drugs and generics. OPQ regulates pharmaceutical quality for small molecules, new drug and generics, biologics, and non-application products, including some over-the-counter and homeopathic products. The answer is D. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Graham, and I'm in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality within the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality at CEDAR. Today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the policy activities in our office over the last year or so. As you may have guessed, a lot of those policy activities are focused on the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency. On this slide, I'm providing you with a link to a complete list of COVID-19 related FDA guidance documents. However, for my presentation today, I'm really gonna be focused, as you may have guessed, <laughs> on pharmaceutical quality related COVID-19 guidances. And so first up, I want to talk about a guidance entitled Manufacturing Supply Chain in Drug and Biological Product Inspections During the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. So this guidance document gets into, for example, how FDA has been prioritizing inspections during the pandemic. So important to note, right, that inspections have been continuing during the pandemic. Uh, the guidance also gets into how we define mission critical because mission critical inspections have continued during the pandemic. That's one type of inspection that has continued. Um, it also gets into how we will prioritize inspections as travel restrictions are lifted. The guidance also gets into the alternative tools that the FDA has been using to assess facilities during the pandemic. So where FDA staff cannot conduct an inspection, what are the alternative tools that the FDA has in our arsenal to assess facilities? Those alternative tools include things such as record requests, relying upon information from our trusted foreign regulatory partners, as well as remote interactive evaluation, such as video streaming. The document also gets into the impact of the pandemic on pending and approved applications. So for pending applications, uh, the document really gets into the various um, actions that the FDA can take on pending applications. And by actions, I'm including the idea that we may defer action on certain applications. So the document goes through those different actions um, and when we will take those different actions for a pending application. The document also gets into reporting changes to approved applications. And specifically, it gets into if you have to make a change um, to an application because of the pandemic. So, for example, for COVID-19 related treatments, there may be a need to gear up manufacturing. How would you report those changes to the agency and what flexibilities are there in reporting those changes? So the document really gets into that discussion and it provides information on how to get feedback from us if you're considering uh, a flexible reporting strategy. And finally, the document gets into how FDA ensures the quality of imported products while inspections are limited. And so one thing that I want to stress is that after this um, guidance originally published, we got feedback uh, from industry that there was uh, additional clarity needed on certain topics. So we went in and we revised the document. One of the areas that we provided greater clarity on was pending applications. We wanted to make sure it really is clear 
that we are not going to issue a CR letter just because we cannot travel during a pandemic. When we put a facility deficiency in a CR letter, it is because we have identified an issue with that facility for that, for that application. So I do want to make sure that it, that is completely clear. The other thing that we updated in the guidance I just wanted to highlight is sort of the definition of mission critical. We also got feedback from folks that they weren't quite clear on that definition. So we went in and provided updates to the uh, information on mission critical to really make sure that it's really clear what products are in scope of mission critical. So in this slide, I just want to sort of highlight certain uh, content from this guidance document. One, FDA is using all available tools to assess facilities named in pending applications and supplements. Certain FDA inspections do continue during the pandemic. Applications will not automatically receive a complete response because we cannot conduct an inspection due to travel restrictions. And finally, when it comes to post-approval changes, uh, we recommend that you follow existing guidance documents. Uh, if you're considering an atypical or flexible strategy, you can contact us to get advice on that strategy. And I'm providing here the email address uh, that you can use to contact us. That is Cedar OPQ Inquiries at FDAHHS.gov. So next, I want to talk about this guidance document on review timelines for applicant responses to complete response letters when a facility assessment is needed. So as I um, discussed with the manufacturing supply chain guidance, that guidance really gets into the different actions that we can take on pending applications. One of those actions, of course, is a complete response letter. While we wouldn't be issuing a complete response letter just because we cannot travel, uh, there may be um, deficiencies with the application or the facilities such that we have to issue a complete response letter. Um, we wanted to provide clarity on what the review timelines will be um, when the responses to those complete response letters come in. Um, and so this guidance document really provides that clarity and it actually includes sort of ANDAs, BLAs and NDAs, not just original application, but supplements. So next up, I want to talk about this guidance document on remote interactive evaluations. So this guidance really focuses on one of those alternative tools that I was talking about. Um, again, it focuses on remote interactive evaluations, which includes things such as video streaming. So this guidance document really provides sort of detailed information about remote interactive evaluation. So for example, it gets into how we select a site for such an evaluation, how we will notify the facility that we're interested in remote interactive evaluation, how to prepare for the evaluation, how we will conduct the evaluation. And this includes, for example, the technological requirements for such an evaluation. And for example, well, how will we actually review documents and records during a remote interactive evaluation? And finally, it gets into communications between the FDA and the facility during the evaluation. I want to point out that these evaluations are completely voluntary. Uh, they are not considered an inspection under Section 510H of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. I want to highlight that the FDA uses sort of risk management methods and tools to determine when to request a remote interactive evaluation with the facility. And I've talked a bit in this presentation about some of the alternative tools at our disposal. I want to make sure it's clear that we can use those alternative tools in different combinations. So they don't work in isolation. So for example, we could combine a record request with an inspection. Or we can combine a remote interactive evaluation with an inspection. So I just want to make sure it's clear that we can use these tools in different combinations. And it's really the FDA that decides how we want to use the tools. Um, we do not sort of want facilities to contact us and ask us uh, to perform a remote interactive evaluation. Again, it's really the FDA that decides, based upon what we know about that, th that facility, what are the best tools that we can combine to assess the facility. So now I want to move on and talk about a guidance document that is about container closure systems and component changes. We recognize during the pandemic that the supply of container closure system components can be constrained, right, um, during the public health emergency. And as a result, manufacturers of FDA regulated products may need to update their approved applications to make changes to their container closure components. 
Um, and so this guidance document really gets into that. I want to make sure it's clear, though, that this is really focused on glass file and stoppers uh, for parenteral products. So this guidance document then really is providing recommendation to holders of approved NDAs, BLAs, and ANDAs regarding reporting um, changes in container closure system components consisting of glass file and stoppers. And again, this is for sterile drug products administered parenterally. So I want to highlight that this guidance really is collating information that's already available from other guidance documents. Um, and it talks about common CCS changes, recommendation and how um, changes in CCS should be reported, as well as the information that needs to be um, provided in the submission to the agency. It discusses or space tools available to facilitate implementation of such changes. And it talks about how you can get feedback from the agency. So for example, through the use of a comparability protocol. So next up is the guidance document on potency assays uh, for monoclonal antibodies and other therapeutic proteins that are being developed as a treatment for COVID-19. So for these protein products, including monoclonal antibodies and other therapeutic protein products that are being developed uh, for the treatment of COVID-19, these products can have different mechanisms of action. So for, her, for example, perhaps they inhibit viral entry. Perhaps they have FC effector function. So it is sort of an expectation that these products will have a potency assay that reflects their mechanism of action. That is, they'll have a, an in vitro potency assay that reflects their in vivo biological activity. Um, and this is an important uh, component of the control strategy for these products. So there's an expectation that there will be a potency assay that will be used for uh, release, as well as to monitor the stability of the product. And so this guidance document really gets into the details about potency assays for these products, and it provides recommendations for specific assays. Um, binding assays, viral neutralization assays, and FC effector function assays. So now I want to sort of switch gears a little bit and I want to talk about facilities. So we know, for example, during the pandemic that manufacturing operations are being impacted. So for example, certain manufacturing operations may have been delayed, reduced, or modified during the public health emergency. But that eventually, right, facil these facilities are going to have to return to normal operations. And so this guidance document, uh, resuming normal drug and biologics manufacturing operation during the COVID-19 public health emergency, uh, really gets into uh, providing information to help manufacturers during the pandemic prioritize uh, current good manufacturing practices, as well as transition from operations um, impacted by the pandemic to normal manufacturing operations. So this guidance describes how to evaluate and prioritize uh, the remediation of CGMP activities that were perhaps delayed, reduced, or otherwise modified during the public health emergency in order to maintain production um, and the drug supply. So next, continuing on with the theme of facilities, um, I want to talk about um, what to do if employees in a facility uh, are infected with COVID-19. Um, and that is covered in this guidance document, Good Manufacturing Practice Considerations for Responding to COVID-19 Infection in Employees in Drug and Biological Manufacturing. And so this guidance document, among other things, provides information on risk assessments that can be performed to understand the impact of infected employees on products in the facility, manufacturing controls that could prevent contamination, and recommendations on how to maintain the continuity of manufacturing operations. And so I've tried to highlight some of the pharmaceutical quality related guidances um, that have come out related to um, the public health emergency, but there is no way in you know 20 minutes that I can possibly cover all guidance documents. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to take a look at that link I provided at the start of my talk that will take you to that complete list of guidance documents. But I'll just highlight a few here. Some other topics of FDA guidance documents related to pharmaceutical quality includes multiple guidance documents on hand, side, hand sanitizers, uh, documents on compounding, the impact of the pandemic on formal meetings with the FDA, and documents that cover the impact of the pandemic on product development and applications. 
So while I've gone through and tried to highlight some of the COVID-19 related policy work that's happened in our office over the last year, I do want to point out that um, even though we have been putting out these COVID-19 related guidance documents, we've been trying to the best of our ability to continue with other policy efforts, that is other sort of non-COVID-19 uh, pharmaceutical quality policy work in our office. So I just want to walk through very briefly some of that um, other policy work that's been happening. So first, as I think probably everybody knows, um, this is an UFA negotiation here. Um, so we have been sitting at the table in multiple negotiations across the UFA programs. That includes GADUFA, PADUFA, and uh, BASUFA. We've also put out uh, a number of guidance documents that are not specifically about COVID-19. Um, we have put out a final guidance on the development and submission of near-infrared analytical procedures. We have a final guidance on field alert reports, and this is a question and answer format guidance documents. We have a draft guidance out on um, products that are administered via enteral feeding with a focus on in vitro testing and labeling recommendations. And finally, we have a final guidance out on the control of nitrosamine impurities in human drugs. So some other guidance documents that have published in the last year or so. Q12 is final. Yay. Um, in addition to Q12, we've put out um, an FDA draft guidance that talks about how FDA intends to um, implement Q12. We have a draft guidance document out on the use of physiologically based pharmacokinetic analysis for biopharmaceutics applications for oral drug product development, manufacturing changes, and controls. And then finally, we have a guidance document, a question and answer based guidance document that has come out on quality related controlled correspondence. And for this last one, I want to stress that um, what this guidance document does on controlled correspondence is it publishes our most frequently asked questions and the answers to those questions. So the intent is then that industry can go to this document, they can look at those questions, and instead of having to submit a controlled correspondence to the FDA, they can get the answers they need from that guidance document. I also want to point out that while I've been focused on guidance documents uh, during the presentation, this is not the only policy document type that we have. We also have things such as uh, MAPS and compliance programs. Um, and so in the last year, we had the compliance program come out on surveillance inspections of protein drug substance facilities. We also have, uh, for example, a map that came out on evaluating color additives and flavors intended for oral drug products submitted um, or referenced in INDs and NDAs. So now to the challenge questions. Which of the following um, is or are true regarding remote interactive evaluations or RIEs? RIEs are considered an FDA inspection. You should contact the FDA to request an RIE. FDA may request records or request that a facility participate in a remote interactive evaluation prior to an inspection. RIEs are mandatory. Which of those is true? And the correct answer is that FDA may request records or request that a facility participate in a remote interactive evaluation prior to an inspection. The other statements here are false. RIEs are not an FDA inspection. Um, you should not contact the FDA to request an RIE, and RIEs are voluntary, not mandatory. So challenge question number two, which of the following is or are true during the public health emergency? All FDA inspections have stopped. My pending application will automatically receive a complete response because the FDA cannot conduct an inspection. I should follow existing guidance documents for post-approval changes. And atypical and flexible strategies can be considered for post-approval changes due to the COVID-19 pandemic. D, all of the above. So the correct answer is I should follow existing guidance documents for post-approval changes and that we will consider atypical or flexible reporting strategies. So. Um, again, um, all FDA inspections have not stopped. We are still conducting inspections. Pending applications will absolutely not receive a complete response just because we cannot travel during the pandemic. So I want to thank you for your time today. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues in OPMA and ORA. Thank you very much. These 
a great pleasure to participate in the Pharmaceutical Quality Symposium, especially in these challenging times brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, where all of us in the pharmaceutical and health areas are asked to find better ways to ensuring continuous supply of needed medicines to our patients. My colleague Nancy Rowley from the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations and I are happy to share with you our collaborative efforts to provide oversight to facilities involved in the manufacture and testing of pharmaceutical products for our U.S. patients with regard to inspections. Before I get into my presentation topics, I like to say a few words about my Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing. The mission of OPMA is to ensure that quality is built into commercial manufacturing processes and facilities over the product life cycle. My office assesses all types of applications from small molecules to biologicals and determines if a pre-approval inspection or pre-license inspection is needed and coordinates with other partner offices like Nancy's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations or the Office of Biotechnology Products, a sister office in OPQ, to conduct these inspections. You can find more information about OPMA and the other offices in OPQ in the two attached reports which we issued recently our annual OPQ report issued in February 2021, and also in the State of Pharmaceutical Quality report issued most recently in August 2021. Here I provide a brief outline of my presentation. First, I will briefly describe the landscape of manufacturing and supply chain as it has been shaped by the COVID-19 pandemic, and then provide a general overview of some of the immediate response actions we have undertaken at the FDA and CEDAR to address these challenges. I will then describe our approach to facility assessments and describe the set of alternative tools we have deployed to mitigate the pandemic travel restrictions, including the application of remote interactive evaluations. I will close with a summary before I pass on the microphone to Nancy, who will describe some of the initiatives that her office has been leading. I do not think it should be a surprise to any one of us that like many other goods and services, the supply chain supporting the manufacture of FDA regulated products has been impacted at multiple levels, from development to manufacturing and shipping as a result of unavailability of personnel, materials, services, and equipment. Just for reference, note that 55% of drugs going to our patients here in the USA are manufactured at sites outside the US. More so for active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, with about one third of sites producing these APIs located in two countries in China and in India. CEDAR has acted swiftly in very close collaboration with other centers at the FDA and stakeholders, including international regulatory authorities. This slide 
just lists some of the actions we have taken. We have expedited assessment for drugs in shortage or drugs meant to treat or used to support COVID-19 treatments. We provided feedback on CMC inquiries and established a dedicated OPQ mailbox to address and expedite our response to industry questions. In some cases, there was a need for inspection and due to the travel restrictions, we implemented alternative tools to assess facilities in lieu of inspection. I describe some of these tools in the coming slides. We issued several guidance documents to industry providing direction on manufacturing, supply chain, and inspections. We provided information on how we use alternate tools like 704A4 records requests and RIEs to assess a facility. We also published the Resiliency Roadmap for FDA inspectional oversight in May, explaining our prioritization approach to inspections. First, concentrating in conducting mission critical inspections for products treating COVID-19 or those having a breakthrough, a breakthrough therapy designation or those treating a serious disease or a medical condition and there is no other substitute. Finally, but not least, we have engaged with international regulators and industry and organized a workshop in record time in July. The two-day workshop focused on quality as part of a joint international effort to accelerate the availability of the life-saving therapeutics and vaccines. ICMRA just published a transcript of the presentations that include key enablers and bottlenecks from regulators and industry, and also a statement identifying the foundational elements needed to allow regulators act quickly and exercise regulatory flexibility and approve such applications. In this slide, I list some additional actions we have taken to enable COVID-19 manufacturing capacity. We engaged with sponsors to provide strategies to increase capacity. We applied a risk-based approach for post-approval submissions, allowing flexibility on the amount of information that needed to be submitted upfront for review and guided sponsors on submitting comparability protocols or modify the filing category to allow them time to provide the information to the agency. We held regular meetings with them and when absolutely necessary, we used regulatory discretion to release products treating COVID-19 and mitigate drug shortages. During the pandemic, OPMA has continued to use the same quality standards to do risk-based assessments of products and facilities. If we determined that an inspection was needed, we explored using alternative tools to assess the facility, such as relying on mutual recognition agreements with EUA and UK, relying on information from other regulatory authorities through confidentiality agreements, requesting information using 704A4, or requesting to perform a remote interactive evaluation with the facility. In this slide, 
I explain our methodology of performing the facility assessment. First, there is a facility risk assessment that is done in close collaboration with the Office of Regulatory Operations. If we have enough information based on history of the facility that mitigate the risks of the application, we'll take an action. If we do not have information to lower the risk, then we determine that we need an inspection. If we need an inspection, then we evaluate if we can use alternate tools to assess the risks. If yes, we then use these alternate tools like MRA reports, 704A4 record requests, or RIEs to gather information on the facility. If we have issues from the review of this information, we communicate to the facility and request additional information. Upon receipt of the new information and review, we can take action on the application. If the answer to can we use alternate tools is no, then we evaluate if the application involves a mission critical product. If the product is mission critical, we will attempt inspection. If it is not mission critical, we will hold for inspection when it is safe to travel. If we are able to inspect the facility before the action date, then we go ahead and inspect, communicate issues to facility, and take action to the application. If we cannot inspect, but there are other areas that identify issues with the application, such as in the clinical area, we will take action and CR the application. If there are no other CR issues, we will miss the UFA date and we will wait to perform an inspection and then take action on the application. In this slide, I share the impact of the use of alternative tools on applications that we received since the start of the pandemic. We reduced the need for pre-approval inspections by 55%. Note that in general, approximately 20% of applications are deemed to require inspections. We also enabled action on over 60 original applications and on more than 1,100 supplements of drugs and biologics used in the treatment of COVID-19. Also, we maintain on action above 90% across all UFA programs, thus meeting our mandated commitments to the industry. Few words about the Remote Interactive Evaluations, RIEs. Nancy will also talk more about them. We issued the guidance in April of this year to explain what firms should expect when we determine that an RIE can be performed with a facility. RIE means a remote interaction with a facility via live stream video, screen sharing, and teleconferencing. RIE is voluntary and a facility is not obligated to participate, and it is not considered an inspection under Section 510H3 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. In this slide, I provide a little more information about the process that leads us to request an RIE. We use complex management models and tools to determine risks and whether those risks could be mitigated using a remote interactive evaluation. From a practical approach, an RIE will help us assess risks identified during application review, 
provided we have no data integrity or other concerns that would require an inspection. Generally, we request records and other information under Section 704A4 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act before initiating a remote interactive evaluation. And a closing note on this slide. FDA will not accept requests from applicants or facilities for FDA to perform a remote interactive evaluation. We have performed a few of these RIEs, and here I provide some of the key takeaways. Live streaming quality is critical to observing facility operations. We need to have adequate Wi-Fi signals to support video streaming. Some areas did not have access to Wi-Fi signal. It is necessary to have multiple portable tablets for visits to facility and labs. It is difficult to do close-up observations or observe unit operations. RIEs are valuable to enhance our information we received via 704A4 records requests, but still limiting for an in-depth assessment of data and to verify equipment CGMP use and maintenance. Finally, the timing of the RIE needs to be as such as to complement the application assessment. I will conclude my part of our presentation with the following remarks. OPMA and ORA have utilized alternative tools to inspection wherever possible. This enabled us to reduce the need for pre-approval inspections and pre-license inspections by approximately 55%, and we were able to maintain on time action of greater than 90% overall across all user fee mandated goal programs. Applications will not automatically receive a complete response because of the need for an inspection that cannot be conducted due to travel restrictions. And record requests and RIEs may be used in lieu of inspections to make application decisions, but they are not considered inspections, nor do they preclude a follow-up inspection. And finally, process knowledge, strong pharmaceutical quality systems, and quality maturity management will greatly facilitate the use of alternative tools in application reviews. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I will be happy to take your questions after Nancy's presentation. Like COVID-19 pandemic that requires all of us to do our part to combat it the same way Quality medicines require all of us to work together to achieve them. Let's do it. We owe it to our patients. Thank you. And Nancy, please take it from here. Hello, I am Nancy Rowland, the Deputy Director of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Operations within ORA. I want to thank Stelios for taking the first portion of this presentation. Just like with this presentation, ORA works very closely with CEDAR and we have a great working relationship. Today, I will be discussing some of the alternative inspectional tools that FDA is using to ensure safety and quality of FDA regulated products. In March of 2020, when FDA temporarily repaused non-mission critical inspections, we increased the use of alternative tools and implemented new alternative tools and approaches to ensure the safety and quality of FDA regulated products. This slide shows some of the tools that we have used to monitor FDA regulated products. One very valuable tool 
has been the sharing of inspection reports from our trusted foreign regulatory partners. The inspections conducted by those foreign authorities for which we have a mutual reliance agreement in place allow ORA to use the results of these inspections to make regulatory decisions and inform decisions on new drug applications. You may ask, how are outcomes of alternative tools used? The results of these alternative tools have allowed FDA to make pre-approval application decisions for those firms which have a qualifying GMP inspection for a similar dosage form. If a firm has only been inspected for a non-sterile dosage form, that inspectional history could not be used to make an application decision for a sterile product. Record reviews have also identified areas of focus for future inspections and in some cases have led to product recalls, import alerts, and warning letters. Sampling of incoming products at the border have also helped to ensure the adequacy of drugs coming into the United States. Sampling incoming hand sanitizers at the borders have resulted in the detection, the detection of high content, content and led to and numerous led to recalls and import alerts. During the pandemic, FDA has increased communications between CEDAR and ORA. We have added weekly meetings to discuss the status of upcoming user fee inspections, mission critical inspections, and prioritized inspections. ORA and CEDAR also work together on the evaluation of new drug applications through the establishment of the integrated quality assessment teams who are responsible for reviewing applications and determining if an inspection is needed. Criteria for determining if an inspection is necessary include the firm's GMP compliance status, types of products manufactured, and a review of the application to determine if they can be considered mission critical, which would include COVID-related therapies, new drugs for which there is not an alternative drug on the market, and drug products that may be in a drug shortage situation. If an application is not deemed mission critical and FDA can't safely travel to the particular location, then a remote assessment can be an alternative option. A remote assessment can be conducted under our 704 authorities and will include a request for records. A 704A4 can be used to assess a facility's GMP status. These reviews can be used as a bridge to our next inspection and can identify potential issues for future inspections. Requests for records using our authority under 704A4 can be used to make application decisions for firms which are currently in GMP compliance and have an inspection for a similar product. If a firm which is a tablet manufacturer was in compliance during the last inspection, a new application for a similar product may be evaluated using a remote assessment. If that same tablet manufacturer submits a new application for a sterile product that previously was only inspected for non-sterile dosage forms, then an on-site inspection will be required for the application approval. In addition to our 704A4 reviews, we are also conducting remote interactive evaluations. These are considered voluntary and a firm will be asked if they would agree to the remote interactive evaluation. In April of this year, FDA published guidance called Remote Interactive Evaluations of Drug Manufacturing and Bioresearch Monitoring Facilities During the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. If you have not looked at this guidance, I strongly recommend you review it. There is a lot of good information within this document. Records Request under 704A4 of the FD&C Act. In 2012, the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, otherwise known as FDASIA, added a provision of the FD&C Act. Section 706 of FDASIA amended Section 704 of the FD&C Act. 704A4 allows FDA to request in advance of or in lieu of an inspection within a reasonable time frame 
within reasonable limits in a reasonable manner records or information that may inspect under 704A4. Prior to the pandemic, there were a limited number of 704A4 requests made, but in March of 2020, FDA expanded the use of these authorities to evaluate pharmaceutical manufacturers throughout the world. It was a very important tool and allowed us to obtain information which could be used to evaluate new products coming to the market and to obtain information about the quality of drugs being produced. What should a firm expect during a 704A4 review? The investigator will notify the firm via email of the 704 request. These record requests are conducted under FDA authorities in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Failure to respond to the request can result in an FDA action, including warning letter, placement on an import alert preventing entry of products into the U.S. market, or withholding of a new drug application. The firm will receive the notification and request for records via Form 4003, which will provide some background information regarding the reason for the request and the documents requested. If the records that are requested by the investigator are not in English, the documents will need to be translated into English. All translated documents should include a certification stating that the translation translations are accurate. To facilitate the records review, please provide all records requested or provide a reason for any records that are not provided. If a record request refers to another SOP or procedure, you may also want to include that record. Also, if an SOP is requested and your current SOP does not cover that time period in question, please provide the SOP in place at the time and or the history page for the SOP. After the initial documents are received, they may be follow-up questions or requests for additional records. The request for records will include a time frame for submission to FDA. Typically, the original 704A4 request has a 30-day time frame, and follow-up requests typically have a 15-day time frame. If for some reason a firm will not be able to meet the time frame, it is important that it is communicated to FDA. In this case, the firm should reach out to the investigator and let them know of the delay or they can submit some records and provide a date that all documents can be provided. This date should be agreed upon by both FDA and the regulated firm. Remember, a non-response can result in a regulatory action. When objectionable conditions are found, the firm will be notified in writing and they will have an opportunity to respond. All responses should be received by FDA within 15 days of the firm receiving the list of observations. The results of the records review will be used to prioritize future inspections, inform application decisions, and may be used to take action against products for which there is a public health risk. 704A4 evaluations completed since March 2020. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, FDA temporarily paused non-mission critical inspections. Since that time period, there have been numerous record reviews conducted using 704A4 authorities. The review of 704A4 record requests resulted in the approval of 256 new drug applications and 58 withhold recommendations. On the GMP side, there have been 267 foreign facility evaluations and 450 domestic facility evaluations conducted under our 704A4 authorities. What to expect for remote interactive evaluations? In addition to conducting 704A4 requests for records, we have also started to conduct remote interactive evaluations. 
or RIEs. As mentioned earlier, these are voluntary and the firm will be notified of the request for a remote interactive evaluation. The firm must agree to the request as they may only be conducted on a voluntary basis. If the firm refuses, we will still make a request for records under our 704 authority, which is afforded by the FDNC Act. Once the firm agrees to an RIE, the planning will start with an initial meeting to discuss what will be covered, what we would expect to see during the RIE, proposed dates, followed by a discussion of what platform to use, such as Zoom. Many RIEs will begin with a 704A4 request for records to facilitate the inspection. Another topic to be discussed is any differences in time zones and how that may impact the time spent each day on the remote activities. Once all the logistics have been arranged, there will be technology check in advance of the RIE to test the systems and capabilities of the platforms and to verify the ability to view the manufacturing areas and review of records. An FDA 42 notice of inspection will not be issued for RIEs as these are not considered inspections. The RIE may be conducted by an inspectional team that includes CEDAR and ORA staff. The remote interactive evaluation provides for investigators to see in real time the manufacturing facility and to get a close-up look at equipment and to have an interactive dialogue with firm management. At the conclusion of the RIE, the investigator will have a closeout meeting with management and, if applicable, will issue a written list of observations. The written issues observations will not be listed on a standard 43 inspectional observations. Following the RIE, the investigator or investigational team will write a report outlining what was covered and include a description of any inspectional findings. Like a records review, an RIE may be used to make an application decision and will be used to inform future inspections. The firm should respond to the written observations within 15 days for it to be considered when FDA is evaluating any new identified issues. Takeaways from the RIE experience. Remote interactive evaluations can be a valuable tool and add an extra component of interacting with employees and observing facility operations. But in no way are they meant to replace an inspection. Inspections remain the gold standard. The quality of the live stream video and the coverage provided during the RIE is critical to the value of the remote interactive evaluation and must support audio and video streaming. Also, the initiation of a 704A4 prior to the remote interactive evaluation helps to facilitate the experience. What to expect during an inspection? In July of 2020, FDA resumes non-mission critical prioritized inspections. For the safety of FDA investigators and firm personnel, during this time, with few exceptions, inspections are being pre-announced due to the pandemic. At the time of pre-announcement, discussions should be held of any social distancing requirements or requirements to enter the facility, such as temperature monitoring or vaccination requirements. During the inspections, Social distancing should be practiced whenever feasible. You may want to consider having a separate area for review of records, computer terminals for review of SOPs, or large rooms set up with microphones. If during the inspection or shortly after the inspection, if anyone from the facility has tested positive for COVID and has come in close contact with FDA personnel, please notify the individuals of this. Also, to reduce the time spent at the manufacturing facility, inspections may also include a 704A4 request.
This slide shows the total number of inspections performed and planned by FDA across all program commodities. In fiscal year 19, there were 18,000 planned inspections, of which 16,920 were conducted, or 94%. In FY20, there were 21,000 inspections planned, of which nearly 13,000 were completed, which is 61% of the planned inspections that were accomplished. That concludes my portion of the presentation. We will be taking questions later this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great presentations. I'm Ray Ford with Cedar SBIA and I'll serve as your moderator for today's Q&A panels. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. Looks like <coughs> we have a few questions coming in right now. And the first um, two questions will be directed to Dr. Rowley. And here is the first two questions. And there's going to be a combination question, so we'll be combining two questions. And here's the question. What is the difference between the IR, the RIE and 704A4 record review? The second part of the question, what action would be taken in case if a firm declines an RIE? Good morning, and thank you for that question. So the difference between a 704A4 review and a remote interactive evaluation is that a remote interactive evaluation is conducted on a voluntary basis. A firm must agree to the remote to their remote interactive evaluation. For a 704A4, we have our authority under the FD&C Act, so those would be required. If a firm chooses not to voluntarily participate in a remote interactive evaluation, there is no penalty at all. That is, again, voluntary. If a firm does not respond to a 704A4, they can be subject to a regulatory action. Thank you for the question. Thank you for responding to that question. We're moving over to another presenter. And the next question will be directed to Dr. Sinotides. And here's the question. If the FDA using remote interactive evaluations, is the FDA using remote interactive evaluations for domestic inspections? And does FDA expect to use RIEs beyond the current pandemic? Ray, um, thank you very much for the question. I will try to answer it and, and say that we, the FDA uses the same approach in evaluating assessments, whether they have domestic sites or foreign sites. We apply the same criteria and uh, we utilize the information that we have about the sites it, to support the application and the complexity of the process involving the application to determine whether we require an inspection or not. If we determine that the risks cannot be mitigated from the information that we have or by utilizing the 704A4 records request of the FD uh, of the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act or through an RIE, 
we will perform an inspection. If we determine that the risks can be mitigated, then we apply those alternative tools. Will we be using these tools post-pandemic? Certainly, we have learned several lessons during this pandemic. We have implemented alternative ways of working, and we will continue to evaluate these tools and how they are applicable in a post-pandemic situation and if we indeed they can still provide the utility, we'll certainly continue to use them. I will reiterate what Nancy also said earlier that inspection is the gold standard of evaluating a site when the risks are high. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We'll now move to another presenter, Dr. Graham. We have a couple questions that came in for Dr. Graham. And here's the questions. It's a two-part question. There is a lot of information in FDA's COVID-related guidance documents that has general utility and will be useful to maintain post-pandemic. Will FDA be reviewing its COVID guidance documents to adapt them for long-term future use? And the FDA has withdrawn the hand sanitizer guidance. Can you comment on that? Looks like we're having some connectivity issues. We'll, we'll uh, allow our technical experts to um, help Dr. Graham to, with the connectivity, and we will move on to another um, speaker. And it'll go to one second, please. Have a little bit of connectivity. All right. And it'll go to Dr. Rowley. And here's the question. Does FDA use overseas employees in India to conduct on-site inspections? And this can be in addition to remote inspections. And could you could and could decrease potential travel from here to India and also increase application actions? Can you comment on this, please? Yes, thank you. So we do have two foreign offices, uh, one in China and one in India that have FDA drug investigators at those locations. Those investigators are charged with conducting foreign inspections in China and India. We also have detailed people to those offices for long term to assist in the inspections of the overseas facilities. And they are limited to China and India. Otherwise, we would be conducting mission critical inspections in the rest of the world. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're now moving over to another speaker. So a few more questions came in. This is for Dr. Sanantides, Dr. Sanantides, here is the question. It's a two-part question. How is an inspection decided to be mission critical? And um, an example, if you can provide one, would help with better understanding. And the second part, another question also came in. What risk criteria is considered to be determined PAI versus 704 records request alone versus 704 records request with RIE. Ray, um, thank you very much for the questions. I will take the first one and just uh, remind our audience on the information I shared on the slides and Lori as well. 
um, our guidance, um, especially the manufacturing supply chain and for drug and biological product inspections that we issued in May. Question two specifically addresses what type of inspections are deemed mission critical. So does our road resilience roadmap on the inspections that was also issued in May that specifies again what constitutes mission critical inspections. You'll find them there. And um, such mission critical inspections are related to products that have received break, breakthrough therapy, for example, designation, orphan drug designation. Um, they are again listed in the regulated products shortage list for CEDAR and they treat serious disease um, such as COVID-19 or any disease that there is no available treatment. So please refer to our guidance documents. With regard to um, whether we will continue, what criteria we're using in determining whether a pre-approval inspection is needed or we could do a alternative tools such as 704A4 or RIE. Uh, obviously, we evaluate the information that is supplied to us uh, with the application very thoroughly. We take into account all of the information we have about sites, the complexity of the process, and together all of that information, we um, account whether with all that information, we can lower the risks with the proposed manufacturing process and application. The risk factors that, for example, push toward an inspection is a new facility that has no history uh, of inspection with, uh, with, with FDA or other regulatory authorities. A very complex manufacturing process that has not been covered um, in a prior inspection of the site. Um, maybe potential integrity issues that the site has. So these are certain risk categories or, or factors that could push um, our determination that we need an inspection rather than an alternate um, tool. Thank you very much and I hope I answered the questions. Thank you for responding to that question. We're now going to move to another presenter. The next question is for Dr. Nancy Rowley. And for Dr. Rowley, here is the question. Are FIE inspectional observations available via Freedom of Information? And how many RIEs have been conducted to date? Thank you for that. So to date, ORA has completed two remote interactive evaluations. Um, Stelios can comment on ones that were that he had also performed, but we have completed two of them. And the report can be requested under the Freedom of Information Act. And I'll turn it over to Stelios. Thank you, Nancy. I, I believe we conducted in, in the biologics area two or three uh, RIEs so far. We are in the process of planning um, some additional RIEs in the near future. And I just um, want to again reiterate that um, those RIEs are not mandatory. Um, we we approach the facilities, the sponsors, with the request uh, and whether they are willing to perform an RIE. And we work with them to schedule it um, to meet both uh, stakeholders' goals. And um, if it can happen, it will enhance our ability to assess the application. If, for whatever reason, it cannot happen, it would impact um, our ability to, to uh, act on the application. So we encourage 
industry to consider our requests and work closely with us to continue to apply this tool. And as we, as we continue to apply it, we'll certainly improve the way we engage with industry. And I am sure we'll find better ways to continue to improve that engagement and uh, be able to um, accelerate our review process and act on the applications. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Uh, we have a few more questions coming in. And uh, the next question, it, appear, it appears it's being directed uh, to Dr. Busi. And here is the question. Does FDA use overseas employees in India to conduct on-site inspections? This can be in addition to remote inspections and could decrease potential travel from here to India and also increase application actions. So that's a two-part question and we have another part. I'm going to turn this over to Nancy. Nancy, do you, would you like to talk about um, that since that's in your um, purview? Hi, this is Nancy. I think that question was already responded, um, but we are using investigators who are assigned to the offices in China and India to conduct mission critical and prioritized inspections in those countries. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a few more questions coming back in and we're waiting for connectivity check to, um, to make certain. One second, please, Lyle. I'll wait for my uh, document to repopulate. It'll be just a moment. And it's just, just a quick reminder, if you haven't had a chance to um, enter your questions in the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. Ah, we have a repopulation of the document. So the next uh, couple of questions, we'll be going over to... Sorry about that. We lost connectivity for a second to Dr. Busi. And here is the first question. There's a lot of information in FDA's COVID related guidance documents that has general utility and will be useful to maintain post pandemic. Will FDA be reviewing its COVID guidance documents to adapt them for long term future use and FDA has withdrawn the hand sanitizer guidance. Are you able to comment on that? Cindy, I'll, I'll answer for Lori, um, Lori Graham, about the, these guidances. Um, definitely, we are looking at the COVID guidances to determine whether they are um, potentially use, useful moving forward. And we also have a PDUFA and PSUFA commitment on the guidance for use of alternative tools post the public health emergency. So we'll be taking a look at that as part of our commitment to our user fee goals. In addition, I, I think just announced the guidances on hand sanitizer are going to be withdrawn effective at the end of this calendar year. So, um, so that's where those particular guidances stand. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters for those great presentations and for responding to numerous questions that came in. Uh, we're battling with the weather a little bit, so our, uh, thank you for hanging in there as far as connectivity is concerned. And uh, now we'll go into our 